Hi, I'm Diane McGarry with Drake at Arts. With me today are co-host Tom McGarry, author Suda Balagopal, and ASL interpreter Janet. Thank you for joining us for our November Arts Reading and Q&A. Suda's fiction straddles continents and cultures, blending thoughts and ideas from the East and the West. Her highly commented novella, In a Flash, Things I Can't Tell Emma, was published by Ad Hoc Fiction in 2021. She is author of the novel, A New Dawn, and two short story collections. There are seven notes and missing and other stories. Her collection of flash fiction is forthcoming from Alternating Current Press in April of 2024. Her short pieces appear in Craft, Smoke Long, and Slip Lip, along with other journals. Nominated for several awards, her work is published in Best Microfiction 2021, 2022, and the Best Small Fictions 2022, 2023. Recently, her story won the Craft Amelia Gray 2000K contest. When she's not writing, she teaches yoga. Suta, we look forward to hearing your works today. Thank you so much for this opportunity. It is my pleasure to be here. Thank you. What did you have in mind for us to, to listen to? I'm so excited. Um, I thought I would read from my novella in flesh, oh, Things nice. I Can't Tell Amma. So um, since 2016, I've been writing mostly flash fiction. That's fiction that's under a thousand words, but the thousand is at the uh, long end of the style. It's typically around 500 or less words. So this novella in flash is a relatively new genre where the uh, novella is written in flash style which means every chapter is flash length and every chapter should technically be able to stand on its own as a story. Oh, nice. How, however, it still has the same characters. It will have a longer story. So it's a little bit of a technical challenge and it's very fascinating to me uh, that you can take one story out of this mix and that story can stand alone or you can leave it in and you will have the big picture with the entire story unfolding in the novella. So I just thought because it's uh, something I love, I would read from my uh, novella in flesh. Great. All right. So this was published in... Uh, 2021 uh, by Ad Hoc Fiction in the UK. Uh, Ad Hoc is uh, really the home for uh, no novelle in flash. They they have published, I, I believe, about 45 of them so far. So um, again, this is something that's relatively new and it's catching on and uh, people love the density and the punch of a novella in flash because it has the feel of a novel, but um, and the scope of a novel sometimes, but it it just is compressed, so it gives you um, quite a punch. So here we go. Um, Things I can't tell a month. That's the first chapter. March twenty seventh, nineteen eighty one. I twist the curly wire connecting the rotary phone's receiver to base. My first call to India from 9,000 miles away. Amma will say, this call must be costly. Write letters, except when there's news. She'll ask if I'm eating and sleeping. <laughs> then... As an inveterate matchmaker, she'll push the eminently suitable Mrs. Pai's son in California. There are things you can tell your mother, and there are things you can't. I can tell Amma that the traffic in America is orderly and quiet, that I open a bank account and get my phone connection in one day, that I can use 
an amazing new device, the automated teller machine, to withdraw money instead of going to the bank. <laughs> I can't tell her that my flight arrives late, that I take a cab from the airport at 11 p.m., that the apartment office is closed, leaving me no place to go, that Theo, a young American, wearing metal rim glasses and what she would consider faded denim shorts offers to let me stay with him, that I stay outside the office all night, that I watch male students in togas, fake Greeks in white sheets tied around their shoulders, pivot to loud music across the street, that I wait there until morning, when people walk past me as if a travel-worn Indian woman settled on her suitcases is an everyday occurrence. <laughs> Until Theo, with the metal rim glasses, hands me a mug of lukewarm black coffee and asks if I'd like to freshen up. That he says, I don't have a gun, I promise, with a sparkly smile. Or... Then I run my tongue over slimy teeth. March 29th, 1981. My apartment is next to Theo's. With an ear against the wall, I listen to his television. His dishes clatter over the sound of canned laughter. I calculate the hours. Breakfast in India. Time for hot idlis and chutney or peanut-laden aval upma. When I dial home, the phone rings and rings. Amma will ask why I haven't called Mrs. Pai's son, then contradicts herself, ask why I'm wasting dollars. It's always easier to lie. I prepare to say, his phone must be out of order. I organize my information. I can tell Amma that the grocery stores here are massive, that I can get everything except Indian spices, that I crave her cooking, that I can hear the radio over invisible speakers in the stores, that the phone company's advertisement asks us to reach out and touch someone, that it seems like such a nice thing to do. That my studio apartment is tiny and spare, a twin bed, desk, chair. That my department is half a mile away, that I've been clocking the walk there so I can get to class on time. That I bought myself a plasticky jacket because it's cold here in March. That I have to train my ears to understand American English. That I'm confused about the spellings here that tomorrow is the first day of the quarter, the first day of class. I can't tell her that Theo sees me walking to the grocery store, that he offers me a lift in his car, chipped blue paint and noisy, that the woman on his car radio sings, call me, that he laughs, sparkling again, and says, hop in that I decline and end up trudging back with heavy grocery bags draped on either arm. March 30th, 1981. I ring home for the third time in four days. The phone does not connect. While I try again, I decide if she answers, I'll, I'll preempt Amma and say, Mrs. Pai's son doesn't answer his phone. I can then tell Amma about Dr. E in communications class that his annihilation sounds like annihilation, that I have lunch at the student union, which is big and loud, that they have loads of unfamiliar foods, potato salad, macaroni and cheese, bagels and cream cheese, that there are many television sets that giggly girls at my table watch a show called General Hospital, that a blanket of silence drops when the television screen changes to breaking news, when the newscasters announce someone shot the president of the country, and that 
I can announce is the big shocking news. I can't tell her that Theo is in the student union, that he slides in next to me, that he drinks cola and squeezes a yellow condiment into his many layered sandwich, that he catches me staring at his frayed backpack, ready to snap with the weight of its contents, that he grins and starts to unzip his backpack. And at that moment, they tell us a gunman shot President Reagan, that Theo reaches for my hand, that I gulp and gulp, that the giggly girls are silent for two minutes before they start talking about General Hospital again. Nor can I tell Amma that the phone company's jingle repeats and repeats in my mind and repeats and repeats, that there's an echoey silence at the other end of the line that I understand the Indian telephone company must have disconnected her line because of an unpaid bill that I must accept. She's more miles away than I can count that I want to tell her everything. So that is the first chapter of uh, this a novella in flash. So um, would you like me to continue or would you like me to answer anything about what I've read so far? I, I really you. like the immediacy of this style of writing that it just evokes, I don't know, for me, memories from a different perspective, of course, but memories of a certain time in this country. So anyway, very, very cool. Thank you. And yes, please keep going when other questions are answered. All right. Uh, the second chapter, you will notice uh, that we do tend to sort of skip time, but it's the same characters. All right, quail with a top knot. That's the second chapter. Mm. There's a bird in the library, I tell the librarian. Mm. The university employee has thin penciled brows and a nest of brown hair. I place the encyclopedia on her desk. With an unsteady hand, I show her the wet splatter of bird dropping, an irregular stain on the information about bowling methods. I need this material for class. Maybe where you're from, birds come into libraries, not in Arizona. Her red-tipped finger indicates the closed windows of the air-conditioned building. I want to tell her, in Calcutta, I paid a membership fee to read books about America. That the owner of the corner library kept his windows open. That a Mina family lived in the nook above the front door. That he fed them tiny pieces of mango and guava. That they didn't come in. He also fined me if I damaged a book. She moves the offending encyclopedia away from herself with one finger, studies my embroidered orange kurta, the color of the robes worn by the Hare Krishnas singing in unrecognizable Hindi on the lawn outside. At home, when they roamed Park Street, Amma told me to keep a safe distance. I spot Theo in the library. He doesn't walk up to the counter to say hello or tell the librarian that I'm a friend. What am I supposed to do? I ask. Have you looked through the card catalog? Microfish reader? I ask her for help with the machine. She says she cannot leave her desk. It's a little quail with a top knot. I imagine telling Theo about this creature which defiles the book, then hops into my backpack like he's home. I share an apartment wall with Theo against which I lay my ear each evening so I can listen to Dan Rather on television. Sometimes I hear Theo laugh when he watches Three's Company. 
Sometimes I hear him on the phone, low and intimate. Sometimes I hear him pop a cassette into his player. Sometimes endless love and celebration seep into my apartment. This is the man who calls himself an eternal student. He's going for his fourth degree. The man who offered me coffee, a ride to the store. A bit of excrement lands on my shirt because I cannot look away as Theo kisses a girl in the aisle between library stacks because I'm drawn to his muscled arms on either side of her as she rests against books because I'm staring at the girl with big hair, tan legs, short shorts, and cork heeled shoes. Because I'm wondering how it feels to be kissed like that. This bird made a mess on my research for the paper on polling methods I tell Dr. E during office hours. The professor wears a blue and maroon check jacket. The crease of his khaki pants is as sharp as an envelope slitter. His pink tongue darts out, moistening his lips. When he palms my lower back, I freeze. He refused to accept my last assignment because it was handwritten, even though I'm a foreign student who doesn't own a typewriter. I received a zero my first quarter at the university, off to a bad start. That's a better excuse than my dog ate the homework, he says. My amma says only goats eat paper. As I leave Dr. E's office, the department secretary hands me a message slip. You had a call from a Mrs. Pison? Numbers here. Do you live by a hen house? Mrs. Pison says on the phone. The quail squawks louder on my lap. He's my bird, I say, stressing the possessive. Mrs. Pai's son is the man Amma set me up with. She can't understand why I won't accept her highly suitable choices, three so far. Can't understand why marriage and a degree won't happen simultaneously. I don't ask how Mrs. Pai's son tracked me down. Maybe I should admire his initiative. Maybe Amma knows best. Maybe he'll kiss me like Theo kissed that girl between the stacks. Noisy bird, Mrs. Pison says. Can you get him to shut up? I put the animal on the floor, cover him with my laundry basket. Mrs. Pison says he'd like to see my photograph. I tell him I'm behind on my paper. He doesn't offer to mail me his picture. Instead, he talks at length about his job at a chip-making company in California. Not the kind you eat, hehe. <laughs> I drop bits of apple through the holes in my upside-down laundry basket. Inside the makeshift cage, my bird beats his wings, screeks. Maybe Theo has an ear against his wall. Maybe he's listening to the bird's shrill sounds, this conversation. Maybe he'll pop over, ask to hold him. I'm going to India on vacation, Mrs. Paisan says. My mother wants a Walkman. I told her I don't have time to go shopping. The bird's frantic. Mrs. Paisan is still talking when I hang up. I lift the laundry basket, cradle my quail, caress his restless wings. All right. So that's the second chapter on her scholastic journey in, <laughs> in the U.S. So um, should I just go on with the next chapter? I love the quail. <laughs> you love the quail? I do too. <laughs> 
Yeah. I love birds myself, but the way the quail is brought in and out of the story, it's really nice. It shows a different side of her. Yeah, it is uh, also a matter of uh, two lost people trying to belong to each other. I mean, two lost beings trying to belong to each other. Yeah. So the bird is lost and she's lost. So it's it's a, uh, that's their common need that that they each fulfill. Each one fulfills for the other. She likes the bird and the bird wants her. And yeah. She wants a, yeah. Yeah, that's nice. There's such a delicacy. I mean, a lot of people don't appreciate birds as pets, but there's such a delicacy to them as an animal too. I mean, they're very light and they're fragile and yet they're also robust, just as she is in this. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, I'm glad you got that. So uh, like you see, there's, there's so many elements to to the story and it's, it's only like four pages. Um, <laughs> and these are, slightly longer flashes and there are also very short flashes in in this book um so there there you can experiment in in a novella and flash because you can you can change uh, the uh the you, you can first person to second person second person to third person uh you can you can do a lot of uh lot of experimenting like you have a one sentence story you know which i i do happen to have i think in this one and then so really? there's yeah it, it's very short uh it usually it's it won't be it, it usually not very the the one sentence story is not usually not very long i'm just trying to make sure i have one and there's there's a couple of chapters written in the style of a letter so that letter is it's you know is, is a story in itself, but it's in the form of, is written in the form of a letter. Um, oh, yeah. Very nice. All right. So I can go on to the third chapter if that's okay. Okay. Sure. Be wonderful. Yeah. It's called The Missing Eye. You're late. Gladys, the typist, examines my scrawny handwriting. She licks an inked, ink-stained index finger, flips through the pages. It'll be $24 for 12 pages, $6 extra for the rush job. Theo, my neighbor, referred Gladys. He didn't say she was expensive. Gladys wears thick glasses, eyes hidden behind their unkind density. A desk crowds the tight room. I'm wedged into a chair, satchel on my lap. Stacks of papers overwhelm her table. She takes a sip from a large mug. Please wait while I look this over, she says. I may need clarifications. Her voice is raspy as if she has laryngitis. The stench of stale coffee hovers. I want to tell her many things. I cannot afford $30. My fingers hurt from writing all day. The professor expects a typed paper. I'll have to drop the class if I receive another zero. International students must maintain the requisite credits. I don't want to return to Calcutta a failure. Instead, while she reads, I stare at the typewriters that sit on sturdy shelves. The gray Remington reminds me of unpleasant typing lessons with the corpulent doc, Mr. Dutta back home. The cloying odor of his hair oil filled my nostrils as he leaned his considerable torso over my table. Every 15 minutes, he came by to remind me, A-S-D-F-G-H, or he said, QWERTY, remember QWERTY. I didn't complete the course. My college application declares a falsified typing speed of 30 words per minute. The machines on Gladys's shelves are arranged alphabetically. The green Olivetti between a sleek Corona and a sturdy Remington. I wonder if Theo owns any of these brands. His machine makes comforting clickety clacks interrupted by the rough of the carriage return. When I place my ear against the wall separating his apartment from mine, I learn things about him. When he eats, 
when he wakes, when he's on the phone. A scrap of paper taped on the Olivetti reads, for sale. Gladys encircles phrases, flings the sheets toward me. What are these words? Write them out in capital letters. I have six more papers due this quarter. How much for that typewriter? I like green things. Green grass, green parakeets, green mangoes. Gladys drops her pen, clicks her tongue. It sounds like annoyance. $50 if I type this paper for you, if not 60. I write her a check for $60. The tailgates of the bus disappear into the hush of dusk as I arrive at the bus stop. I sit on the edge of the sun-heated, graffiti-stained bench for 30 minutes. Soon, a dust-laden wind rises, whistles through my hair, an impending Arizona monsoon storm. I walk the two miles home. Gladys didn't give me a case for the machine. A spritz of rain dampens my hair. Some drops land on the typewriter keys. It's 8.30 p.m. when I walk into my building. A party is in full swing in the recreation room. Strains of funky town battle the din. Never mind it's a Tuesday night. The banner on the wall outside the room reads, Congratulations, Prince Charles and Lady Diana Spencer, 729-1981. No one else seems to have a paper due. My quail shrieks as I enter the apartment. I pick him up, caress his wings. When he quiets, I put him back into his makeshift cage. Theo's television is silent. Maybe we'll hit our staccato keys in synchrony tonight. Mm -hmm. He and I held hands once when we heard President Reagan was shot. I place an ear against the wall, hear muffled voices, one male, one female. Occasional words waft. Warm today, would you... I'm certain she's willowy with carefully tousled hair, a hint of moist color on velvet lips. All night I type. All night, between the metallic clacks and kerchunks, my ears trained for noises from next door. All night my bird is still, confused by the activity and the bright lights. I reread the paper with gritty eyes. Dr. E, my professor, will give me a zero. As soon as it's daylight, I call Gladys. The phone rings and rings and rings. I imagine she needs her glasses to answer. It's early, she rasps. What do you need? The typewriter's I is broken. I mean, the letter I doesn't show up on the paper. She clicks her tongue. It sounds like annoyance. Just write the damned I in. She hangs up. Theo didn't tell me she could be rude. On the other side of the wall, his television's tuned to Good Morning America. I pick up my pen. So that was chapter three. And in just three, cha three chapters, I think you get a sense of this, the student's arrival and the adaptation process and time has passed uh you know and she's already in school she's got work that she needs to do but all of this in three short chapters mm -hmm. that's the uh that's that's precisely why i like flash because you can condense so much you can condense time in in just a few chapters mm -hmm. A whole lot of it is by implication without saying it directly. Yes. Yes. And, a lot of it is between the lines. Yes. And uh, I, I don't know, it, it Does is this based partly on a lot of your personal experience? It just seems so real. 
<laughs> um, yes, I did. I did come to go to school here, but uh, there was no seal. <laughs> and was, uh, that and there was no bird. Uh, all that, oh. and there was no typewriter issue. Uh, oh, wow. All that is made up. But okay. the time uh, frame is about right. Huh? Uh, wow. The early eighties. Wow. Uh, and the, the rest of the story is completely made up. Okay. Wow. And I think just drawing uh, from uh, real life experiences allows a story to be authentic. I think this is, uh, I'm, I'm not, it's not my story, but some of the elements uh, like the music and the TV shows uh, allows me to bring that sense of authenticity to the story. Uh, and it's something that like I watch Good Morning America. So, you know, and Dan Rather. So, you know, that was real to me there's a real facts but the rest of it is not real so did you want me to go on or did you have any questions tom has another question just a moment one last comment i notice uh even though each chapter is very short uh there are callbacks to elements from the previous chapters and i would guess that's extremely deliberate is it yes definitely right. so if i take one chapter the typewriter chapter up you would still know, for example, about Theo. You would know about the professor, yeah. even though I haven't spent time explaining these characters. Mm. It's about her getting herself a typewriter so she can do a paper. Mm. Um, so the idea is to literally make every chapter sort of independent, yeah. but still part of the whole. It doesn't feel like too much repetition, hopefully, mm. uh, even though I bring the same characters again. So it seems to me that would make it harder to decide what to include, that you, you really have to go out of your way to include hints, but also uh, events and descriptions in later chapters because you can't re recreate them completely. You have to Absolutely. give yourself information in a context. Yeah. Exactly. Absolutely. And, you know, so this this habit she has of putting her ear against the wall to listen to because she doesn't have she doesn't own a TV. Yeah. Um, I know I've repeated it in every single chapter so far, mm -hmm. uh, but if I didn't mention it, I'm not able to give the reader a sense of her relationship to anybody outside of her, of that, of that uh, lady she went, Gladys, that she went to get her typewriter from. Mm -hmm. So I want to have her have not just, it's, you don't want it to be just a, uh, a single relationship story. I want her to have, a presence where she is oh. a human with more than one element right, in her life, right? She has a neighbor, she has a bird. So I want to bring all of those elements. So if I didn't do that, then it would be very unidimensional if I yeah. took the story up. That's the reason I have to, it is very, um, you're right. It is kind of uh, interesting and it's difficult. You don't want to be repetitive, but you want to give hints uh, that, and and uh, again, each of these chapters was published independently in um, different journals, completely different journals. And at the time, um, I had a vague notion of putting together this whole thing as a oh. novella, but I didn't really because when the first one was published, I did not have the novella ready. And when I had the second and the third, I did not have the novella oh, ready. Wow. But I knew that I am going in a certain direction and that this could very well be part of something much bigger. Hmm. Wow, yeah. thank you. Yeah, that's really interesting. And also, you're right, putting your her ear against the wall brings in other characters, but it also, people who do that are a special type of character themselves. <laughs> Right. I mean, yes. We all go up and listen at the doors of other people. It's just, it's a way of being with others that isn't really okay, right? We're not supposed to eavesdrop on people like that. But you can imagine this is student housing. Yes. The studio yeah. apartments. Mm -hmm. And and you can hear a lot. Oh, gosh. Oh, oh. Those walls are paper thin. You can definitely hear a lot. And now that I can say from experience, <laughs> you know, because it's it's very hard to concentrate when you have your, you know, your neighbor uh, playing very loud music or, you know, talking very loudly or having people over I and mean, you have work to do. And it's it's kind of you're snug in your little studio apartment. So um, it can be pretty loud. But I just put that in because this is her way of trying to get information because yeah. she doesn't have a medium to get news from. And she mm -hmm. wants to know American TV. So mm -hmm. how would she do it? 
Mm. Just like, like, okay, let me listen to this TV. <laughs> yeah, but even within walls, I mean, that's gone back, not just student housing, but there's a lot of tenements and things where the walls are not very thick. But mm. to actually purposely go and listen, mostly we try to, like even in a hospital room, right? There's very few private rooms. You try to give privacy to someone else, right? And, and yes. try not to listen or pretend not to listen and just shut it out somehow but she's purposely intruding really in a way on his space that he has no idea is happening no he doesn't know um hmm. uh, i just the way i envision this her bed is against the wall ah. and she's sitting on the bell and a bed and then she just leans and she can hear hmm. what's going on hmm. um so uh i'm not sure as somebody who's from another country i'm not sure that she thinks this is eavesdropping. Uh, oh, interesting. She doesn't have the same uh, sense of privacy that you know the Americans have. Mm. Uh, like I do have a friend in India who just would 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 come visit and take lots and lots of pictures, and before I know know it, all mm. of my pictures are on social media, and I'm like, you know, do you know I don't like this? Mm. You don't ask because she's like, why? I want to tell everybody, you know, this is where I live. This is. Where and we value privacy a lot more than they do because she doesn't see it yeah. as an invasion. She sees it as sharing information. Yeah. Well, mm. I know people who do that in this country too, that the line has got mm. blurred because it's so easy to transmit everything to millions of people as opposed to just who's your immediate intimate friend or family. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so th that could be part of the... Uh, thing where she doesn't think she's eavesdropping she's just saying i'm getting information and i'm i get to watch tv without watching it <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's an interesting thought thank you puts a different yeah. twist on it because i was thinking oh. it's more complex usually things are pretty complex especially when you deal with different cultures oh yeah um and you don't realize you're sometimes you're stepping on toes and mm -hmm. what might be okay in one culture is not okay in the other culture. So, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Yeah. Even, I mean, not just cross countries like that, but also within this country, there's differences between New England and the South and the Midwest and the West Coast. Absolutely. Totally. Yes. It's like if you went to, uh, from Texas to Seattle is like going to another country. Oh know? yeah. Really yeah. different. Yeah. So we often go from Massachusetts to Texas and it is a different country. <laughs> uh, well, I don't want to get this sidetracked, but thank you. And we would love to hear more from this or another one of your writings. It's up to you. Okay. Um, let me, okay. So uh, since I mentioned, um, I could read, uh, uh, <laughs> okay, let me just read the very last chapter. Sure, of course. So, uh, and then uh, because uh, you will see how uh, how it, the, the the relationship has changed. Mm. Oh, okay. Yes. Bridge across oceans. Mm. You drive me to the airport after I clean my apartment and return the keys to the office. Blinding sunshine reflects off the chipped blue paint of your car. You roll the driver's side window halfway down. The stuttering air conditioning doesn't work on the sweltery summer day. On the way, breath hovering by the roof of my mouth, I wait for your words, my throat arid. I reach for your hand so we can intertwine fingers as we did that afternoon when the president was shot. You extend an arm to turn on the radio instead, where someone's singing about a crazy little thing called love. Dissatisfied with the choices offered, you fiddle and fiddle with the knob, changing five stations before you turn the device off. Twelve minutes into the ride, I break the silence. The spate of words inside me wants to flood the car. 
I say, you're the first person I met in this country, and it's fitting that you should be taking me to the airport. I also say, you can turn down your television now. I won't be placing my ear against the wall between our apartments. <laughs> you don't respond. A nervous giggle breaks loose. I apologize for forgetting my cardboard box of books in your apartment, the university texts for which I've paid hundreds of dollars. I request you to mail the package to India, even as I cross my fingers, hoping you repack the contents, read the note I've left you. Your answer is not what I expect. You say you moved the window box over to your apartment, so my quail, dear Moti Chotu, Bobby Sam, can continue to have his treats. When I thank you, you say the quail will miss me. And isn't it strange that he's been visiting of late? Minutes of awkward, quiet prickle. I ask you to keep my typewriter, dig for a response. You tell me you'll sell the machine back to Gladys. I fake laugh and say she won't give you a penny. You say you wouldn't bet on it. I know you like your bets and remind you about that time you bet your spicy omelet at our cafe would taste better than mine. When your eyes teared from the piercing heat of the jalapenos. I don't say it's the same place where we sat in a corner booth, shoulders flirting, elbows caressing. You say an eyelash swam in your eye. I watch you focus on the traffic ahead as if there's nothing more to say. As if you didn't bring me pumpkin pie, smile sparkling. As if you didn't hold me when my teary, tired body wanted to crumple on Thanksgiving day as if you didn't become disappointed angry when i didn't spend christmas with you and your family you drum your fingers on the steering wheel i ask again why you can't comprehend i must go my mind harbors disquiet about my mother about sleazy mr sen it terrifies me when he answers her phone you say Amma is a mature adult who knows what she's doing. I describe again how unworldly she is, how alone, how ill, how I have a responsibility. You open your fist, study the map of lines in your palm, say you don't know how to bridge, a, how to build a bridge across oceans. You pull up to the curb at the airport. A chill whips my skin when I realize you won't walk me to the gate. I crave a kiss to have, to hold, to cherish. I reach for you after you get my bags out of the trunk. You put your arms around me, rest your chin on my head and say, Bye, have a good life. The words arc their way into my ears and then sink like crumbling boulders all the way into my toes. You slide your long legs into the driver's seat and adjust your glasses before you belt yourself in. Your arm sticks out of the open window as you wave goodbye. 30,000 feet above Earth, I adjust and readjust the airline's flimsy, child-sized blanket over cold arms. Close my eyes. I map your drive home where you will unpack and repack my box. Find my invitation to meet Amma because it's time I told Amma about you. It's time I told Amma everything. So that was the last chapter. And you will notice Theo is the you. So uh, your style can change as the chapters move on. Um, he, he doesn't have to be Theo anymore. He can be you. It also, uh, the I... I used that second person for him because it uh, spoke of an intimacy that was not there in the earlier chapters. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that was the end of the book. Yeah. We just went from the first two chapters to the last yeah. chapter. Wow. Thank you for showing us how the story ends. I'm sure there's much more <laughs> to bring. <laughs> there's a lot between. Yes. Yeah.
And there's a, a lot of sadness and heaviness in that last chapter too. There is, there is. Um, well, there's a lot of emotion. So uh, I, I, when there is, uh, and it, when you have a lot of emotion, it, it speaks of an intimacy, mm. right? It, it, that's the only way I know how to illustrate that there these two people are close. Sure. Yeah. So uh, I can completely change <laughs> to read something totally different. Right. Okay. That would be nice to so, see it in style. Yeah. Uh, okay. So let me see. This is, uh, since I spoke about one sentence, uh, this is in Best Microfiction 2022. Uh, I was very honored to have one of my stories in there. Um, and it's a one sentence story. Oh, no. <laughs> it is. So in in Flash, you can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, you can break rules as long as you know the rules. <laughs> you know, that's the thing. <laughs> so um, bitter hot chocolate. The doctor laughs when my 10-year-old says her throat is too narrow to swallow the chunky pill for her ear infection, but I convince him her gullet tightens around the tablet until she cannot breathe. So he asks her to open wide, shines a flashlight, then says there's nothing physically wrong, plenty of room for the antibiotic to slide down, but... Once home, she makes gagging sounds, wraps fingers around her neck, and turns beet red when she must take her medicine. So I'm forced to call the physician, who chuckles and says I should stir the pill into hot chocolate, at which I gasp, and he says he's not joking. So I buy the fanciest Swiss package, dissolve the medicine into the beverage, and my daughter swallows the frothiness licks the mustache off her upper lip and remarks that the creamy chocolate is bitter but tasty, to which I respond, that's chocolate for you. And because she grins after the course of antibiotics ends, I add to her mini mouse mug multivitamins, cough medicine, oh. even anti-diarrheals on Ugh. occasion. So she believes this is good chocolate. The drink everyone loves despite the taste. And I tell her it's sort of how beer is popular, how people love it. And I shouldn't have used that particular comparison because too soon at 16, she begins to relish beer. And before I absorb the beer situation, she gets attached to this guy who has a pungent temper and a delicious smile, a wild man who cannot be tamed, a creature all her friends adore, and she swallowed his temper, his hot words, his beatings, his cheatings, but won't let go of him. Even when I say she should, even after I introduce her to an upright young man who on their first date places a cup of unadulterated hot chocolate before her, but she accuses him of doctoring the beverage, uh, screaming that it tastes all wrong before she goes back to find that fellow with the pungent temper. So I call the doctor and tell him he should never again recommend <laughs> mixing medicine into a beverage. And he responds, no laugh. There are reflexive actions involved in swallowing. Fixing those is beyond his medical expertise. <laughs> That's my one sentence. Story. Wow. <laughs> That's quite a sentence. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and the whole story. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's 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 two pages, literally two pages of Whoa. printed material. But uh you can really compress a whole world <laughs> into the two pages when you use the style. Yeah. And there's and, multiple plot arcs in there with yes. the, uh, the, the the chalk with the medicine and the young woman and the beer and the development and uh, dating the wrong guy. So, but they're overlapping. So really cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So literally this is just, it's, it's, it's fabulous because now you'll be thinking about hot chocolate or you know, hopefully you'll be thinking yeah. about hot chocolate. Like, okay, you can doctor it. You can put things in it. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, there's one more in, in the uh, Best Micro Fish in 2021. Now, this is also, it's super short. Uh, and it's literally half a page in this. This is it. It's just half a page in this book. And it uses uh, a strategy that, again, is used in, in the flash style. It's this repetition where the first uh you can use a, a repetitive phrase to begin a phrase, a, rep a repetitive word or phrase to begin a phrase or a sentence. Uh, and then you, it keeps repeating and repeating. But you you still, it, it's almost like a, a, a rhythm to, you know, it's to your story. It, it affords a rhythm to your story. And this one is called Filtrum. After your deployment... After the static riddled calls, after the thousand word emails, after you return at Christmas break, after I memorize the indentation above your upper lip, after you say it's called the philtrum from the Greek for love charm, after the solitude of cold sheets when you leave again, after your helicopter splinters, after your ashes arrive, after he is born, after he's placed in my arms, after I don't want him, after I recognize you in the dip of his upper lip, after I fall in love again, I ask you, why must this beginning come after an ending? And I just realized it's Veterans Day today. <laughs> oh, yeah. And yeah. So, uh, again, very, very condensed. Mm -hmm. The after is, uh, it gives you the uh, the rhythm for this. It also keeps the attention of the reader mm -hmm. uh, and uh, helps with the ending punch. You know. yeah. Okay. Very powerful. <laughs> I'm open to any questions or yes, there's always more that I can read. <laughs> yeah, it brings you back when you do repetition like that, it brings you back, you know, it's like rewinding the clock. We're going back to the beginning, but not quite. It's a spiral. Not quite. It's a spiral. Exactly. Exactly. So we're not, we're not moving too far from the beginning. It's still, it anchors you, goes and comes back to the anchor. You know, every sentence comes back to that after anchor, you know. And then you know something's going to happen after. Yeah. That's why that after is so significant. Sure. Yeah. Yep. Sure. So uh, um, I can read another one or I can uh, answer any questions or I don't know how much time we have. We have about... Um... Seven minutes. Uh, Susan or Josie oh. have, or Tanya, do you have any questions? You can put them in the chat. I know people are often shy. Tom and I aren't so shy, but. <laughs> Please don't be shy. <laughs> oh. It's really interesting seeing your, your writing styles because a lot of it um is description or just dialogue back and forth right there's not a there's nothing superfluous in anything you write there isn't room yeah you know uh i don't have the luxury of describing the day for example um i don't have the, i mean unless it's it's critical to the story i will put a sentence in mm -hmm. uh, i don't have a the really the luxury of describing what she's wearing or what she looks like in my novella, uh, you still don't know anything except that she's a student from India. You don't know anything more than that. But uh, just from her actions and uh, her thinking and the, her interactions with the other people, you get a sense of who she is without me giving you her physical description. Oh, sure. Sure. Oftentimes people um, rely on describing the day or the season. They really uh it's just a different way of presenting. Yeah. 
and it's quite amazing that you can uh, you can until you start writing flash you don't know how much is extra that's how much you write that's extra it's not needed yeah tanya says i've enjoyed learning about the style of fiction and entering the world of your story i have well, too thank you. Very thank you thank you very much it is truly fascinating. And that's why, you know, it's hard for me to go back to writing longer fiction, even though I wrote longer fiction for a very long time. It's very addictive uh, and very seductive uh, because you, uh, you not only, it's not just the style, but what you can do with the words and how you can arrange them in different words. There's this hermit crab flash style where you use the, uh, I've used the times table to tell a story. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and that, that was in best uh, small fictions last year. Uh, it's like I, I just said lifetimes nine. And then I went through nine, 18, 27, 36. But what happened to that character at each of those ages? Uh, oh, neat. Yeah. So it was uh, that's that's uh, again, this is experimentation. And I don't think a regular traditional storyline would allow you to experiment like Flash does. Yeah, I really enjoyed the different, uh, well, in in the novella, the different styles, especially the second person at the end, but yes. also your example of the extremely long but very powerful sentence there. <laughs> Seeing uh, you didn't just say it exists, you, you showed very good examples. So thank you. Okay, thank you. And thank I, you. Tanya has a comment about that. She said the hot chocolate story is brilliant. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank, thank you. The bitter medicine in the beginning to swallowing the bitter relationship. Uh, exactly. <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad she got that, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it's compelling to see how you strip this down to the essential. Yeah. Yeah, most people think, you know, when I say I write flash, they say, well, you write it in a flash. And I'm like, well, couldn't be farther from the truth. Mm -hmm. I don't write it in a flash. It takes me a long time. So no. uh, it's... Uh, it just appears that way when it's finished that because it's so short, you know. No, it's a, it's a big craft and to to be able to strip things down to just what matters. That's a real skill. Yeah, I, I, it takes just practice. It just takes practice and doing it again and again. It's like anything else. You just do it enough number of times and it comes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's true. Well, I'm I'm glad to have talked about Flash and the novella and Flash, which again is my my new fascination. Yeah, uh, you know, I I like the idea of a novella that's condensed and tight. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. It's really thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes, it's been my pleasure. Thank you for it was just delightful and interesting and well, sad and powerful. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'd like to thank our sponsors, too, for making this program possible. If you know any of them, please thank them yourselves. To become a sponsor or receive more information about our Drake Arts Arts Saturdays and other programs, please email us at drakeatarts at gmail.com or visit our website, drakeatarts.com. You can view this and all of our programs on our YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash at Drake at Arts. Thank you so much. <laughs>